A central feature of the Marxist economic framework is the idea that some of the labor done by workers goes unpaid. This surplus labor corresponds in turn with surplus value, which itself relates to the profits realized by capitalists after the sale of output. Marx argued that some portion of the labor time expended by the working class is paid in the form of wages. This is the labor that is necessary for the reproduction of the working class. The remaining amount of labor is a surplus reflected via commodity exchange in the form of profits. The ratio between surplus labor and necessary labor is what Marx called the rate of surplus value, or alternatively, the rate of exploitation. The bigger the rate of exploitation, the more time workers spend performing surplus labor relative to necessary labor. The rate of exploitation can be influenced by many different forces, and as such is different from company to company, industry to industry, and country to country. Wages, for instance, are heavily influenced by class struggle. The more the working class has organized against the interest of capital, the bigger piece of the pie it has been able to secure for itself. Conversely, a particularly powerful capitalist class can lobby for an increase in the working day or a decrease in wages both of which will raise the rate of exploitation. These dynamics necessarily mean that the rate of exploitation will differ substantially at the international level. Specifically, nearly all the workers in the so-called Global South will be exploited at a greater degree than their northern counterparts. Apart from a higher rate of exploitation, there is another method by which capitalists can extract value from labor, super-exploitation. It was Rui Mauro Marini, a Brazilian Marxist economist, who first explored the notion of super-exploitation. Marini argued that if capitalist exploitation refers to the appropriation of value exceeding the value of labor power, then super-exploitation is a particular form of exploitation where the value of labor power is violated. Workers that are super-exploited are paid a wage below the socially determined level of reproduction. It is important to point out that superexploitation should not be conflated with a higher rate of exploitation. The latter suggests that the cost of labor power is still equal to its value, but both have been commensurately driven down, for example by increases in productivity. Superexploitation is specifically the form of exploitation where the cost of labor power is less than its value. This means that capitalists can increase the rate of exploitation by way of higher productivity without introducing any superexploitation. Put differently, superexploitation occurs when some portion of the wage fund is moved into the accumulation fund. Although superexploitation is predominantly a feature of underdeveloped economies, it certainly manifests in the global north as well. Migrant workers, for example, are particularly susceptible to superexploitation often being paid a fraction of the market wage rate in a given industry. Wherever superexploitation occurs, it tends to leverage the correspondingly weak socio-political power of workers. The benefit of superexploitation undoubtedly accrues to the capitalists of the global south, who are extracting the value of labor power at an extraordinary rate. However, southern companies and exporters generally do not possess much market power, meaning they are facing stiff international competition and are probably unable to keep all of the gains from superexploitation for themselves. Instead, it is multinational corporations, primarily based in the global north, who have the market power to absorb the bonus surplus from superexploitation. In an increasingly complex global economy where supply chains stretch across dozens of countries, it is nigh impossible to measure just how much value is added by unpaid labor for a given commodity. This reality is, of course, one of the main motivations for what is sometimes called global labor arbitrage. Global labor arbitrage is the practice of offshoring labor-intensive production processes to countries or regions that have exceptionally weak working classes. In such places, the cost of labor for every unit of output can be minimized dramatically. Moreover, some component of the reproduction of the working class occurs entirely outside market spaces. Food, fuel, and domestic care is procured by families in economic activities that go entirely unlisted in formal national accounts of output. Most importantly, these necessities become uncosted inputs for capitalists who nonetheless appropriate the value added by workers in their productive facilities. Although he was not referring specifically to workers of the Global South, Marx once noted that this kind of labor is exploited twice over. 
both by its own employer and by the employer's competitors. Much of today's global economy is predicated on this arrangement, where southern workers produce surplus value for the capitalists of the South and the North. It is worth adding that the kinds of commodities southern labor is employed to produce are not merely related to raw materials and basic manufacturing. Increasingly, even the most advanced manufacturing supply chains draw on the surplus labor of the South. The case of the Mexican automotive exports paints this picture perfectly. Although Mexican workers produce the very same cars that their American counterparts make in the United States, they are paid a fraction of the wages. Lenin spoke of another beneficiary in this economic structure, the workers of the North. In imperialism, Lenin introduced the idea of a labor aristocracy, in other words, a privileged working class in the imperial core that to some extent benefits from the super profits extracted by northern companies. This position of privilege, Lenin argued, could also motivate workers in the global north to support imperialism. There is no doubt that, knowingly or unknowingly, the majority of residents in the global north recognize the advantages they possess by virtue of belonging to the winning side of the global capitalist structure. Still, we should be particularly careful about drawing political lines between the working people of the world. For one, the capitalist mode of production by definition requires that it is the owners of capital who control the distribution of the total value produced by society. It is questionable to what degree, if at all, northern workers play a part in deciding the global distribution of value. More pertinently, with the production of many commodities requiring the labor of both northern and southern workers, it is in the interests of both groups of workers to engage in class struggle together, rather than siding with their respective national capitalists. Modern communications technology has paved the way for coordinating labor action at the international level, making the threat of unions potentially more powerful than ever. The first step to moving beyond the current mode of production should therefore be a sharpened international class consciousness that mobilizes labor along the wide-reaching supply chains. International class consciousness should be particularly cognizant of super-exploitation and the general reliance of global capital on the extraordinary appropriation of southern labor's output.